أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ قال إبراهيم لأبيه آزر أتتخذ أصناما آلهة إني أراك وقومك في ضلال مبين وكذلك نري إبراهيم ملكوت السماوات والأرض وليكون من الموقنين فلما جن عليه الليل رأى كوكبا قال هذا ربي فلما أفل قال لا أحب الآفلين فلما رأى القمر بازغا قال هذا ربي فلما أفل قال لئن لم يهدني ربي لأكونن من القوم الضالين فلما رأى الشمس بازغة قال هذا ربي هذا أكبر فلما أفلت قال يا قوم إني بريء مما تشركون إني وجهت وجهي للذي فطر السماوات والأرض حنيفا حنيفا وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. I'll translate to you the verses I began to recite from the Quran. Ibrahim, the Prophet Ibrahim عليه السلام, said to his father, "How is it possible that you take idols as your lords? I see you and your people are in complete misguidance." Allah says, and that is how we showed Ibrahim the. Malakut, the kingdom of the heavens and the earth, so that he could become a person of certainty. So at night, when he saw a star, he said, "Could this be my Lord?" But when it set, he said, "I don't like those things that set." When he saw the moon rising up, he said, "Could this be by my Lord?" And when he saw it set, he said, "If my Lord doesn't guide me, I may be of those who are lost." When he saw the sun rising in its full brightness, he said, "This might be my Lord. This is bigger. This is greater." But when it set and it disappeared, he said, "My Lord is far removed from what you associate with Him. I have turned myself sincerely to the One that created the heavens and the earth." Hanifa, in pure monotheism, and I am not of those who make equals to Him. This is one of the greatest prophets of Allah, Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Allah points out to us how his journey to becoming certain in Allah, his journey towards having 150% trust and conviction and certainty was through his relationship and reflection of the world around him. The sun, the moon, the stars. To the extent that when Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ نُرِي إِبْرَاهِيمَ مَلَكُوتَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ We showed Ibrahim the extent of our universe. Some scholars of tafsir mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought Ibrahim either in his sleep through a vision 
to see the entire universe. Allah gave him a tour of the universe in his sleep, in his vision, so that he could be in awe, he could be amazed at the creation of Allah that would give him certainty. This certainty, this 100% conviction, this then helps him when he gets thrown into the fire, when he gets tested by his people, when he becomes in to trick and finds himself in tricky situations. But all of this is his understanding, his reflection, his contemplation of the world around him. I will apologize for one thing, which is that my slides are not as beautiful as Sheikh Masood's slides. Uh, the reason is that Sheikh Masood, he's one of the senior scholars in the science of PowerPoint and paint. And this is not a subject I took ijazah from my teachers. But Sheikh Masood has a very high qualification in this regard. So I am only his student in this subject. So my apologies for the plain text you will see in the coming slides. The first thing we need to understand when it comes to space, and just like Sheikh Masood said, I'm no scientist, just as he's no biologist, is we have to understand what is our place in this universe. This is the first thing. The speed of light, this is the first thing for us to understand. The speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. I know in Bradford they try to drive quite fast, but not quite as fast, no. They can try, unfortunately, not as fast. 300,000 kilometers per second, yeah? Which is roughly 180,000 miles in one second. That is how fast light travels. Now, Earth, this planet, we are eight and a half light minutes from the sun. That means at this speed, it takes eight minutes for the light to get to us from the sun. Yeah, you can imagine how many millions of miles we are away from the sun. That's just from us to the sun. The nearest star to us after the sun is called Proxima Centauri. We are 4.3 light years away from this. That means light takes four and a half years to get to us from the star. Four and a half years at this speed. The nearest, the North Star, what you see in the sky, what you people call the North Star, which they use for navigation. This North Star is 320 light years away from us. That means when you look up at the sky now, when you look at the star, the North Star, what you are seeing is what it looked like 300 years ago. It just, the light just reached you. Yeah. Right now, that's not what it looks like. It's 300 years ago. We are in a solar system, which is inside a galaxy, the Milky Way. The center of this galaxy is 26,000 light years away from us. The nearest neighboring galaxy, what postcode are we in? BD3, BD1? BD8, yeah, so like BD7, right? The near neighboring galaxy is two and a half million light years away from us. And the oldest galaxy that we can see through all of the devices and telescopes that we have is 13 and a half billion light years away. When you realize this, you realize that we are nothing but a speck <laughs> in the grand scheme of the universe. We are nothing. Allah reminds us of this in the Quran when he says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الْإِنسَانُ أَنَّا خَلَقَنَاهُ مِن نُطْفَةً Doesn't the human being see that we made him from a drop of fluid? فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمٌ مُبِينٌ But then they become arrogant. وَضَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلًا وَنَسِيَ خَلْقَهُ they give us examples, analogies, debates, arguments, but they forgot how did they come to be. And so Allah reminds us of how small we are. And this universe, we have to realize what we see is very little compared to what really exists. There's so much we don't even know about. Now, the first thing after the universe itself, understanding where we are in the universe, we should reflect on the stars. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions stars in the Quran many times. Who can give me some examples of stars mentioned in the Quran? 
الشمس والقمر بحسبان okay yes the sun is a type of star what else what is the word for stars in arabic or star najm or nujum who can give me some verses with wan najmi idha hawa allah swears by the stars in surah an najm what else wa idha an nujum tumisat mashallah very good young man you had your hand up the same one yes an najm wa shajar yasjudan allah says that the stars and the trees prostrate to him what else an najm wa thaqib allah talks about in surah at tariq an najm wa thaqib what else وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدَرَتْ وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدَرَتْ Good. وَبِالنَّجْمِ وَبِالنَّجْمِ هُمْ يَحْتَدُونَ Now this is the function of stars. So for the longest times, human for the longest time, human beings have admired and looked up at the stars in the sky. But what purpose did the stars have for the Arabs? Direction. Not just for the Arabs, for other than the Arabs. Yes. Yes, so when they would travel at night they didn't have GPS. No, neither did they have ways nor did they have Google Maps. So they would use the stars. And I mentioned before there's a star called Polaris, they called it the North Star. Some stars in the sky are fixed. And they use those fixed stars to understand direction. <laughs> Including correct, yeah. Now, I want to take your attention to one verse in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says فَلَا أُقَسِمُ بِمَوَاقِعِ النُّجُومِ I swear by the positions of the stars in the sky وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَمٌ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ And this is, an, this is a phenomenal oath if only you knew Now if we backtrack for a second, why would somebody in the Arab world, why would they swear by something? I swear by the stars, I swear. Why would they do? Why would they say that phrase? They used to worship Sorry? They used to worship the stars. Okay, so he says because they used to worship. Not quite. Important. Sorry? Important. Yes. You'd swear by something because you want to give it importance. Like for example, some, I'm not encouraging you to do this. Some people might today swear in culture, popular culture. They might swear on their mother's dead body or something because their mom is important to them right just oh i swear on my mother i'm not encouraging anybody to do that by the way we only swear by allah okay so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by the stars but not by the stars by the position. by the position of the stars you know why if you look up at the sky now and you look at the stars right now the stars are not there where you're looking they've moved because it takes hundreds of light years for the light to reach us. What you look, what you can see now in the night sky is where that star was 300 years ago or 400 years ago, not the updated version. You see in this picture over here that the physicists can even measure that within a few months, a star can move and change direction, can move, go somewhere else. But again, what you are looking at is something that, look at the night sky, this star was there 300 years ago, 200 years ago, 500, depending on how far it is from us. So you're not looking at the star, you're looking at the position of the star. This is the accuracy of the Quran's language when it's describing the, the stars in the sky. But why does Allah take an oath by the stars? He takes an oath by the stars to make a different point. That just as people seek guidance from the stars in the sky, and just as they look at it for guidance in the dark night when everything is dark and you don't know where to go and you're lost, you look up at the sky to find out where to go. Just like that, the Quran plays the same role in our lives. Innahu la Quranun Kareem. Fi kitabim maknoon. La yamassuhu illa al mutahharun. Just as a Bedouin Arab in the darkness of the night would navigate using the stars, when everything is confusing and complicated and you feel lost, you have to navigate using the Quran. That is your star. So this is something to reflect on. The role of stars and how the Quran for us is like a blinding star that guides us and shows us the way. There's something that one of the names of Allah that I want us all to reflect on in this light. Which is Allah's name Al-Badi'ah. 
Who can tell me the root letters of this word? You know, in Arabic, all words have root letters. Bada. Sorry? Bada. Bada. Not bada. Bada'a. Bada bada Anybody know any fa popular words with the same root letters? Bid'a. Yes. Bada. Of course, we like this word, bid'a. <laughs> so what does bid'a mean? Innovation. Innovation, right? You're doing something new, something inventive. Al-Badi'a. Allah's name, Al-Badi'a. The one who creates in a very innovative way. What does that mean? Right. Everybody in this room, we could have all looked identical. Right? If we wanted to all be handsome, we should be identical to Abu Aisha. But unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. We all look a bit different. So, we all look different. And if you look at your fingerprints, every finger is different. Every fingerprint is different. Every snowflake is different. Allah could have created them the same. This is Al-Badi. Every time He creates, He creates differently. Yeah, the chromosomes in the human body up to the smallest level and then if you zoom out to the largest level Allah creates everything uniquely he's not like us lazy we just try to copy paste <laughs> yeah, I do the same thing so this name of Allah it shows us the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala architected the universe around us everything is unique every star is different every asteroid is different every Milky Way galaxy everything is different unique it's a different ball game every time Nothing is the same. Just like if you go on Leeds Road now tonight to have dinner, every restaurant is different. <laughs> but the burger places are all the same. <laughs> so, controversial, inshallah. Please don't fight me, I'm from Manchester. So, now there's something different to reflect on. When we look at how did Allah create the universe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, سُنْعَ اللَّهِ الَّذِي أَتْقَنَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ this is Allah's sunnah, His handiwork. Look at the perfection of what He created. Now what does that mean, look at the perfection of what He created? I'll give you an example. There are many numbers, laws that Allah created that are constant, they don't change. For example, gravity. If I drop my phone now, who can tell me how much force is going to press down the moment I let go? 9.81 Newtons. Yeah, that's going to press down on this phone. What happens if one day I drop it and 10 Newtons pushed it down and the next day I dropped it and a thousand Newtons pushed it down and it went, broke the table and went through the earth? It would be quite a problem, wouldn't it? It's always the same force. Gravity is constant. The same force is acting. It's a law. Like this, there are many laws in nature. They are constant, they don't change. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has fine-tuned these laws. Someone said 9.81 force is acting on this phone. Do you know what would happen if it was 9.82? This earth would not exist. Do you know that? If it was 9.81111112, this earth would not exist. The planets, the sun, the moon, the earth, they all have gravitational pull on each other. That's what keeps them in orbit. If the Earth was 0 0.000001 millimeter closer to the sun, this planet would be too hot for us to live on it. And if it was one millimeter farther away from the sun, it would be too cold for us to live on it. And what keeps them all in orbit in this exact distance? Gravity. Who chose the number for gravity? Allah. In this diagram here, the, the scientists, they call this the Goldilocks zone. All of the physical constants, electromagnetic force, the things that gives us electricity and magnetic pull, etc. And the nuclear force, the force inside the atom. If this was different by 0 0.000001, stars would not shine, or hydrogen would not form, or no reactions would be possible, or nothing would exist. If these elements, these constants change a tiny bit, a fraction, nothing would exist today. It was fine-tuned. Carefully fine. All of these constants were fine-tuned to make human life possible on this planet. And that's why we haven't found human life, we haven't found life anywhere else yet. The more we discover of the universe, the more we realize our earth is unique. 
We have not found a planet yet that has any life on it. The conditions to make this possible are unique to the 0.00001%. This is the design of Allah. Hada khalqullah. This is the design of Allah. The precision of Allah, the accuracy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He designs the universe. Now let's think about the moon. Let me ask a question. What would happen if the moon didn't exist? Does anybody know what would happen? It would be just sun all day light? Okay. Not quite? Yes? There would be no more light anymore? Not quite? Because the moon doesn't give us... Sorry? Okay, yep, yeah, that's one thing. We wouldn't be able to calculate the months as easily. That's what one of the, th the functions of the moon. Yes. Sorry? The tides. Actually, this is something that the, the physicists have ikhtilaf on. <laughs> so I don't know which mother I follow on that one. I'm not uh, educated enough. But I will read you something that a famous uh, physicist has said. He's ben Moore has written a book on the moon. The history and the future of the moon. And this is what he said. He says... If our moon didn't exist, earth would be unstable. It would wobble chaotically in space and that would cause crazy climate change. In a few hundred thousand years, earth would become ice or earth would become fire. The gravity of our moon pulls on our earth and keeps it in the right place and stabilizes our climate throughout the whole year in the 4.5 billion history of our planet. Without the moon, there would be no earth. We don't realize that. When we look up at the sky, we see the crescent moon. But there's something else. The moon has always been important to humans since the beginning of time. Such that the, the Sumerians, the first people who could write, used to worship the moon. And many cultures and people worshipped the moon because this was something beautiful in the night sky that they could see beyond the stars. But tell me, does the moon have its own light, like a torch? What does the moon do? Yeah, it just reflects light. In the Quran, can anybody tell me an ayah where Allah describes this exact thing? Sorry? This is a good ayah, but this is not the one. Hada laysa mawdiya shahid. An ayah that tells us that the sun beams light, but the moon only reflects light. Allah says he made the, sh the sun dhiya. Dhiya is like a lamp. It's a source of light. It beams light. And he made the moon nur. Nur is a reflection of light. The, nobody knew this 1400 years ago. Just like sometimes you see someone you say, MashaAllah, look at the nur. And the correct answer to say is it's just a reflection of these lights. <laughs> That's what nur means. Nur is a reflection of light. There's no light from inside you. One of the beautiful things about the moon is the phases of the moon. Allah says in Surah Yaseen, وَالْقَمَرَ قَدَّرْنَاهُ مَنَازِلَ حَتَّى عَادَكَ الْعُرْجُونِ الْقَدِيمِ We determined phases for the moon until it starts eventually looking like a date stalk, like a crescent. لَالشَّمْسُ يَنْبَغِي لَهَا أَن تُدْرِكَ الْقَمَرُ the sun can never overtake the moon. And night can never overtake day. And they're all floating in an orbit. Everything has its place. And everything has its order. And Allah created an order for these planets. In His beautiful and accurate design. One of the beautiful things for us is to look in the night sky and to see the moon and the phases of the moon. And to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have had full moon and then no moon. But he made the moon show itself in phases so that we could tell the time of day and the month. For millions of years, this is the only way that human beings could tell what day of the month it was through the moon. Millions of years. That's why Allah says he made the qamar husbana, a point of measurement. Practical, this is a practical benefit for us. Imagine a life with no moon, yes, the earth would not exist. 
It would be too cold, too hot. It would burn. Fine. Imagine a moon, but it's a black night sky. There's nothing to look up to. There's no way to measure time, no way to find out where you're going, and there's no way to know what day of the month you're on. You'd be lost. For hundreds and millions of years, this is the only way human beings could. Until today, we are going on the lunar calendar. We are going, we are measuring our days and months. And the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how do you tell the end and the start of the month? Go and see the moon with your eyes. You know, I'm not talking from a fiqh perspective here, but something that's happened today is we have become disconnected to these signs in nature. You know, you're standing out the window and you're saying, what time is Maghrib? Four or three. I would say, don't look at your clock. You're standing at the window, look outside. You should be able to tell whether it's Maghrib time. For thousands of years, that's all they had. They just had to look outside and figure it out. We are so disconnected. If I were to ask you, what time is Maghrib? Just by looking at the horizon, you'd say, I got no clue. What time is Luhur if you look at the horizon? Where, does the sun, where should the sun be? How big should the shadow be? Got no clue. Because we now are relied, we have become so computerized, we need the exact time. Yeah, this is a homework. Go and find out what time is Maghrib time purely by looking outside. Luhur time purely by looking outside. Fajr time purely by looking outside. Yes, times of year where it's difficult to ascertain, that's a different thing. But I'm saying reconnect with nature. Reconnect with Salah times by looking. We had to determine the end and start of months by looking with the bare naked eye. Sumu li ru'yatihi wa aftiru li ru'yatihi. That's what the Prophet says. Don't fast until you've seen it. The vast majority of the world still uses bare eyesight. For a reason. For us to understand the importance of these planets and the way Allah designed the world, we have to interact with them. The last thing I want to end with is that if you look at the images from the Hubble Space Telescope and the recent web telescope that's been sent out to space. And I encourage you to do this with your children. Look at the beauty that exists in space. It's more beautiful than the Peak District, more beautiful than Leeds Road restaurants, more beautiful. Yes. Go and sit down with your family and just find those pictures and read what exactly is this picture describing. This picture is showing what happens when a star dies. You know stars, the sun, every star in the sky, has a, it has a birth and it has a death. When a star dies, it explodes. This is called a supernova. This is what you're seeing here. This is the explosion, the death of a star. This is Allah's sunnah in all his creation. Everything starts and ends. Everything is birth, uh, has a, a beginning and has a, it dies at some point. And then the dust from the star will go and make another star. And that will die one day as well. And you and me will die one day as well. We could be as bright as the sun, but death is going to come regardless of where we look. This, what you can see from the telescope, is 170,000 light years from Earth. That means what you can see happened 170,000 years ago. Not now. We don't have the update. Learning about the universe makes us humble. How little do we know? How much ilm Allah has given? I only gave you a tiny bit of knowledge. You don't know anything yet, Allah tells us. So, to recap, the moon and its phases, the moon and its importance to us, the fine-tuning of everything Allah created, Allah's name, Al-Badi' the stars in the sky, their usage, their birth and their death, how the stars are like the Quran or the Quran is like the stars. And lastly, but not least, our place in this universe. We are nothing, we are small. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored us by granting us messengers and granting us the Quran. He honored us even though we are nothing. He honored us with wahi, with revelation. And uh, I think it should be a practice as families to sit and spend time looking at these documentaries, understanding what's out there, because this increases our iman as we relate to Allah. When you look at all of this, and recently, more and more people are interested in going out into space, Elon Musk, Richard Branson, they're more interested in exploring space for leisure, for fun, for in, you know, excitement, adventure. But who is going to go and take the lesson to realize this could not have all come from nothing?